are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escow. Certainly, if there's one thing we've learned in the past year, it's the vital life-saving uh, properties of pharmaceuticals. Most of us knew that already, but it's been uh, underscored. Also, oh, something else that's been underscored by the pandemic is the extreme inequities in access to certain pharmaceuticals. Now, pharmaceutical reform is a topic or a struggle, let's say, that has to be waged on many fronts. And uh, for some of those fronts, uh, I rely on the work and the expertise of my next guest. She's been on the program before. Merith Basie is executive director of North American Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and uh, she's here to talk to us about some of the fronts in pharmaceutical reform now. So first of all, Merith Basie, thank you for coming back on the program. Thank you, and I agree. Yeah, universities allied for essential medicines is, is quite a mouthful. We can go with UAEM if that helps. UAEM, okay, three vowels and a consonant, okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, um, there are a couple of things I wanted to catch up with you about, Marath, if that's all right. And one of them is there's a lot of debate going on, as you well know, about uh, vaccine waivers and uh, whether or not people should be charged for COVID tests and so on. Um, and I think some of your work is relevant to that debate, uh, specifically um uh, how public funds map into the the uh, tests, the treatments, the vaccines, and so on for COVID-19. First of all, am I right about that? You are very correct. <laughs> so good. Um, I hate to be wrong in public, but it does happen. Um, so let's start with that, if we may. Um, what is, because you, know, you hear this, I, I heard it even over the weekend that, well, uh, for example, Pfizer, I guess it is, should be able to charge whatever they want for their vaccine because they did the research themselves without government money and et cetera, et cetera. You know, it takes many forms. Um, but what what have we learned about the relationship between public funds and these uh, tests, treatments and vaccines for COVID-19? A great, uh, great point. I know a lot of people uh, get confused about who funded what and, you know, who has the right to charge however much they like, despite um, uh, the impact that it has on people's lives. Um, so we, according to a recent report that we've led called uh, COVID Mapping, looking at uh, the public funds coming from uh, going to universities, primarily in the US, but also all over the world. Um, we've seen that $16 billion, this was earlier this year, uh, at the last sort of count, uh, went to public research of tests, treatments, and vaccines for COVID-19, 16 billion. So that's on top of the regular $41 billion that goes from NIH to universities and medical schools every year to do basic research all the way through to clinical trials. So earlier this year, the last count was about 16 billion. $8 billion of that went to uh, GSK, uh, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, and Sanofi. Uh, so even just at the get-go, we know that these corporations are also receiving directly funds from all of us, the taxpayer. And most of those other funds were going to universities and publicly funded research institutes. And this is solely for COVID, right? So this is only just since the start of the, of the pandemic. And just to sort of give you an idea of comparison, in Canada, it was 71 million uh, Canadian dollars. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge amount, 16 billion. Uh, and it means that uh, every single one of the vaccines that has been developed has received in some shape or form public funds directly, not just from European taxpayers, but also from, from the U.S. taxpayer as well. And yet, once again, it seems, Merith Basie, as if these funds were given 
And I agree that $16 billion is a staggering amount of money. I mean, you know, when we hear about, for example, $16 billion to build a whole network of, or refurbish a whole network of highways, you had, you know, supplies and, you know, concrete and trucks and, you know, laborers of, you know, thousands of laborers. But we're talking about essentially as I understand it, primarily cognitive work. So, uh, you know, it's an enormous amount of money. Your report says that Moderna, AstraZeneca, Sanofi, uh, et cetera, and Pfizer have received uh, over $8 billion in U.S. dollars uh, of that $16 billion, a phenomenal amount of money. And yet it appears uh, to all intents and purposes that they were not at, you know, if someone were to give you and I $8 billion, mm -hmm. uh, Normally, which I would be open to, normally uh, they would give it with conditions. We want you to do X, Y, Z. We expect you to present something to us at an end, at the end, at no cost. Instead, as your report uh, notes, uh, three of those companies are raising their vaccine prices, even as the Delta variant strikes, mm -hmm. and Pfizer will make an expected fifteen billion in profit from the vaccine this year alone. So. I guess my question to you is, aren't we, it does, this feels a lot like a one-way street from the people to these pharma corporations. The pharma corporations seem to be extracting lives instead of uh, displaying any kind of reciprocity. Am I being unfair? You are not being remotely unfair. Um, and to sort of give, give the context globally, um, we have distributed now, I think, um, over four, I think it's four billion doses of the vaccine, uh, but only 1.2% of those have been in low and income countries. So basically this is a pandemic of inequality. It's also uh, a pandemic um, in terms of the vaccination rollout of inequality because high income countries are getting vaccinated at 25 times the rate of low income countries and countries like the UK, uh, Germany, Switzerland uh, are still blocking what you mentioned earlier, the TRIPS waiver, um, which the US uh, backed uh, with advocate support uh, back in May. But until we get that across the finish line, it's not going to save lives and help us ramp up manufacturing in poorer countries. But um, yeah, the the both Pfizer and Moderna have upped their prices. I think uh, thirteen and a half percent and twenty five percent, respectively. And yet, people continue to die at an extraordinary rate. And knowing that this, you know, back to the sort of public funds, that people can actually go and check what their local university received. It's publicmedsforcovid.org. It's all there. You can see all the data because this is all basically what we've done is taken everything that's public. Um, which, because they're public grants, we can then uh, take a look at them and put them in a way that's easy for people to find them and to uh, look at that data. And uh, you can check by country as well. We've got about 13 different countries covered. Um, but ultimately, it's just to remind people that this wasn't private funding. This was public funding. It should be a public good. It should be for everyone. And also, even if you disagree with that, knowing that given the way that COVID and Delta in particular is spreading, that it's more contagious than chickenpox, Ebola, uh, in terms of um, uh, the reproduction rate, uh, in the end, the only way to keep us all safe is for as many people as, possi as possible to get vaccinated. And by preventing access in low and middle income countries, it is going to, uh, is not going to curb the pandemic. Uh, and we will continue in this uh, as we've been this sort of uh, process of masking and uh, lockdowns, depending where you are in the world. Um, so we don't know what, what is around the corner with another variant either. That's absolutely right. And, and Merith, uh, I, in looking at, and again, I'll, I'll repeat the website, it's public meds, numeral four, covid.org. Um, are we, there's a lot in this, um it's searchable and so on i'm just curious to know if it includes uh which drug companies got how much 
uh, not just in the aggregate, but individually, because I'd be curious, for example, you hear this from Mark, I believe it is Pfizer Biotech or whatever that claims to have done all the work on its own, but it's apparently received um, public money for this, right? Yeah, so BioNTech, they received, I think it was about um, 445 million euros, I think, from the German government. But let's also remember that these corporations, many of them are not paying taxes, some of them perhaps not at all, but certainly not at the rate that you and I would be paying taxes. Uh, and that, so they're getting these um, incentives in other ways as well. Um, but yeah, you can take a look by, by corporation as well. Um, but I think, again, just to sort of reiterate, all of these corporations are benefiting from our public research, public dollars, and not just from the US, from many different countries around the world. And that's what you can see um, on that resource uh, that we wanted to make as transparent as possible because it is actually normally quite dense to go and see how much your local university or even your government has been uh, providing. And interestingly, the US grants are much more transparent than in fact some of the, the Dutch grants, for example, were very hard to, to find how much was going where, uh, which is problematic in and of itself. But I think what's particularly interesting, there's a couple of key universities uh, here in the US that have been um, recognized for their role in, in sort of producing, helping to produce the vaccine. Vanderbilt University received 65 million uh, dollars from uh, all of us, the taxpayer. Chapel Hill, 91 million. Emory, 53 million. These are huge amounts of money. And yet, not a single university has any provisions or conditions, if you mentioned, to ensure that that public money um, will be, uh, or the results of that public money will be accessible and affordable to people everywhere. Uh, and not even to the U.S. taxpayer themselves. The, and, and I think that's such an important point. Again, my guest is Merith Basie, North America Director for Universities Allied for Essential Medicines. And um, I, that gets me over, I guess, to the a university report card, uh, which can be found at globalhealthgrades.org, which uh, includes... Uh, uh, rates, I should say, universities based on, I, looks like, I guess, five factors, uh, including innovation, access, transparency. Um, and before we get into some of the, if you don't mind transitioning to that, before we get into some of the universities and how they turned out, maybe you could explain what these factors are sure. that they're rated by. Sure. So this is an ongoing report card. And we know that... Uh, Universities often don't respond to pressure uh, in the ways that you might expect, but they really respond to being graded. <laughs> um, and they don't like to be pitted against each other. Um, and it has served us as a, a particularly key tool to um, highlight where universities are failing in the way that they are patenting and licensing in particular, their publicly funded research um, and how they are essentially in and of themselves being barriers to access to medicines worldwide. So we look at a number of factors, as you mentioned, uh, access. So it's like if you are, what sort of research are you doing? Uh, are you focusing on research into things like neglected tropical diseases? Um, and if so, how much of that global health budget are you dedicating to that? Uh, also, we look at um, in uh, the uh, access and innovation space, we also look at how they're licensing, right? So if you are then doing that research, are you patenting and licensing in a non-exclusive way? And a non-exclusive mm -hmm. license basically means that you're not just giving one corporation monopoly rights to, to research and develop that drug or take it through to clinical trials. By uh, allowing for uh, a non-exclusive license to basically open up that innovation to um, generic competitors potentially. And that's what we're looking for basically because it means that other folks in other countries or other co companies could take that 
um, innovation forward and produce it locally. And the more competition we have, the lower the price, right? So whenever there's a monopoly, as we know, this is what's happening with COVID, uh, you're gonna see those high, high prices. Um, and what high prices mean is that people are gonna lose their lives as a result. So we're looking at that. Empowerment means if you're educating your students um, in these global health areas, are you also looking at access to medicines uh, and are you looking at the intersection between intellectual property and access to medicines? Because you can talk about it all you like, but if you actually don't uh, look at some of the key mechanisms behind access, you know, it only goes so far. And then transparency, people may not know, but universities do do clinical trials. Um, about a third of that budget that I mentioned that NIH gives to universities every year, $41 billion, which is huge. About a third of that goes to clinical trials. Um, and many of those are done at universities. Uh, and we want to make sure um, in line with the law uh, that these universities are registering and reporting in a public place so that researchers can access that information. That's what's gonna speed up innovation in a moment, particularly in a crisis like COVID. Uh, you wanna be able to share that data. And finally, we added last year a final section for COVID because we thought we can't put out a report card that looks at uh, what happened in 2020 uh, without focusing on how universities are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that, that's the sort of overview. And then we've ranked them accordingly. Um, and I, I hate to say it, but the reality is we've failed most of those universities. Um, we've failed most of those universities or they've failed us? They are failing us uh, despite their you know, missions that are emission statements that look very lofty and all about global equity and justice. The reality is behind closed doors, uh, the, the agreements that many of them are making are still favoring uh, primarily profit over people's lives. Uh, and we wanted to continue to shed a light on that and urge universities to actually not just be doing the research, which is obviously critical, and we couldn't, we couldn't um, do uh, or have achieved what we have achieved in terms of uh, developing uh, the vaccines without the role of universities. Um, but unless those products are licensed, patent and licensed in a way that protects access, uh, it's hard to, to know who will eventually uh, gain access and who won't. And usually it's, you know, it's people in high income countries and people who can afford it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. We have power and it's public money. It shouldn't be that way. No, absolutely. You know, I've long felt that to me, I've, I've all sort of thought of it as an unholy trinity of universities, drug companies, and federal agencies. Two out of three of those are essentially functioning or should function as public goods, public services, and yet, yet it seems to me the three are interlocked, and I would include in this the FDA, mm -hmm. as well as universities, in uh, and sometimes other government agencies as well, in uh, you know, the drug companies have so much money, I was going to use a mm -hmm. expletive uh, adjective, but I won't, so much money, uh, that basically, and we've sort of neoliberalized where universities get money and so on, that um, I feel as if they're no longer, well, we know drug companies aren't, but they're, people don't understand the extent to which they're no longer perhaps working in the public good, that people who might be, you know, in a position of responsibility at the government uh, as a regulator, as a physician might, for example, then go over and run a company like Sanofi as, you know, whatever it might be that there is, uh, there is a pattern here. And that's why I think your work is so important because it, it shines a light on that. And um, it, it, this kind of uh, relation, set of relationships functions successfully in the shadows. So you do great work in bringing it to light, and one of the things your uh, your report card points out, globalhealthgrades.org, is that only 13 schools have publicly committed to specific forms of licensing that promote access and affordability in low and middle income countries. Now, this isn't just, and, and then I'll stop talking, but this isn't 
this isn't just inhumane in my view, although it's brutally inhumane. It's also, as we're now seeing with COVID, uh, quasi-suicidal because if we don't make these vaccines widely available in poor and low and middle income countries, uh, variants will emerge that as we are now seeing, cause us to slip back and threaten our lives again. So um, I guess with that out of the way, I don't know if you have anything to say. I'm sorry, I ranted so long, but no, I feel no. strong about it. Uh, no, absolutely. And I think that that is, that is the key piece is I think the public facing version of universities is that we are here for the public good to educate the next generation, our future leaders, blah, 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 blah. Um, but there's a lot of power within uh, these offices called uh, the technology transfer offices. And it's, uh, you often cannot get access to the information that you need. Um, and that is where those negotiations happen. Uh, and ultimately, unless these the licenses or uh, are or patenting and licensing that happens uh protect public access this i think this situation is going to continue um to worsen uh right now when you think about people say oh well what about incentivizing pharmaceutical corporations imagine if you had a company and anyone invested a billion dollars, even just to say, let's go with a, you know, relatively small to that 16 billion that we knew that had already been invested by uh, the government into um, the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, tests and treatment, you would expect a return on that investment. And, um, and it would be for massive amounts, given the sort of capitalist structure that we live in, unfortunately. Uh, but this isn't happening for us with the vaccine, right? Uh, right now, uh, the previous or prior to COVID, uh, the best-selling drug, which in and of itself is problematic, uh, Humira, was making uh, $29 billion for the pharmaceutical corporation producing this. COVID-19, is, is that the vaccine for that is already making uh, the same corporation uh, more money. So it was 29, that's 33.5 billion. Um, so we have a moment and why we focus on universities is because it is, I believe, a key uh, linchpin potentially, or a, a lever, I should say, in the whole system. If we focus um, our energy on changing the way that universities patent and license, while we still have power, uh, because we hold that innovation in our hands, we have an opportunity to change the way that uh, drug pricing works in, in the US and around the world. Um, and it, I do think that universities are open to public pressure uh, and should respond to public pressure, given the, the status that they have in society. The other option uh, is also to pressure NIH or BADA, the, the institutions that are giving out these grants uh, of our public funds and say you need to strengthen the conditions attached to this funding in order to secure uh, access for everybody in the US and uh, internationally for the purposes of global health. Uh, because in the same way with sort of climate justice and the planet, like we don't have a planet B, we're all in this together. And as much as the United States or the UK likes to think that they can separate themselves we, COVID has reminded us that we're, we, we are all in this and maybe some of us more unequally than others, unfortunately. Uh, but I think there's a lesson there that we need global solidarity if ultimately if we're going to, to uh, see, see this through. Well, I think that's very well said. And I also agree with you that this is important work because universities are in fact uh, uh, vulnerable, I, uh, I don't know if that's precisely the best word, but susceptible to public pressure because in a sense, universities are uh, the status and uh, respect are their stock and trade, right? I mean, nobody would pay uh, what ultimately amounts to six figures for a Ivy League education if it was a school that was uh, scorned by the public so uh, and one of the striking things to me about your report is that 
even the best scoring universities in your report card do no better than a B minus. And that to me means those universities have a lot of improvement to do. And there are only two of them. Georgetown gets a B minus because among other things, it gets a D for transparency. And uh, that to me, somebody should send that to, is it still officially a Catholic institution? I would think someone should send that to Pope Francis because he might be interested in that. Harvard B minus, again, because of transparency. Interesting pattern developing here, I would say. Case Western uh, uh, with a C, uh, the only does slightly better and so on. Uh, so, what we've got is a pattern of universities that are, in a sense, it seems to me, uh, they may they may be accomplishing fundraising drives, but they are not. Uh, they're failing in their mission to the public, which is to educate and to improve the state of general knowledge. You can't do that, for example, if you keep a a patent a secret and so on. It, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I think, you know, in 1980 was when the sort of Bajal Act was introduced here in the US. And that is what changed the way that universities started patenting and licensing around medical innovation. And so what you see now is universities using um, the patents as a proxy for innovation. So saying like, oh, look, we have the most number of patents. But, you know, for a life-saving medicine, a patent doesn't mean anything if if that medicine is priced at a hundred thousand dollars you know a new cancer medicine and people can't afford it and even with um you know many folks who are on medicaid we can't bankrupt you know you start charging this for every person who needs uh a, a, a medicine in in uh, later in life and uh it we won't be able to sustain that but we know that here in the United States, where a vast majority of this medical research is happening, funded by the taxpayer, uh, people in this country pay about two and a half times uh, what they do in other high income countries for the same product. Uh, and a lot of that is also to do with the, the fact that also uh, there can't be Medicare negotiations and all these other things that pharma have got their hands into over the last decades, but ultimately, you know, medicines uh, are about one third of the, the the public health budget, if you like, and um, we could reduce that. There could be spending in for other areas, uh, but at the end of the day, I think there's an argument that must be made around ensuring that we have universal health care for everyone. Uh, and I think if it was more public in that sense, uh, the the cost of medicines would be. Uh, looked at very differently, uh, or the price of medicines, because we know the cost is much lower than the price. <laughs> Absolutely. And and on another site, ALT reroute, or, mm. or, uh, dot com clinical trials, and briefly, maybe we can talk about clinical trials, but that report, your report points out that uh, in the United States, every single one of the 210 medicines approved by the FDA between 2010 and 2016 can be tied to funding from the government, from the NIH. And uh, that gets us to the question, which, you know, briefly, I think we can discuss some clinical trials, mm -hmm. um, which are critically important because, of course, clinical trials are the testing of a new uh, medication on human beings. And, uh, you know, reading this uh, report uh, brought to mind for me uh, the comment by Dr. Marsha Angel, who had been the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for 25 years, uh, that she no longer trusts any clinical trials study that comes out of the pharmaceutical companies because of their selective use of information. And mm -hmm. It seems to me that the failure of uh, universities to publicly disclose, as they're, in all cases, as they're required to by law, I wonder if that's connected with that problem at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense, right? If you're a, a doctor or you're a physician and you have to make a decision about which treatment to give somebody, if you only have half of the information, it all looks 
skews po skewed positive and you see none of the negative, you'll be like, sure, take this medication. But if you could see the negative clinical trials, the ones that right. actually um, could show that it didn't have an impact um, or that it harmed people, um, you might make a different choice. Uh, and ultimately, in that sense, you know, in terms of public health and, and also even spending, if that's the priority, um, we want to make sure that uh, we're not repeating clinical trials. We're not wasting funds in, in, in that way because uh, if a trial isn't uh, posted, uh, then we can't uh, access that data and we could make the same mistake if it's negative um, or just uh, waste money by repeating it. But globally, I think it's about um, one in three clinical trials isn't published. Uh, and actually, corporations do a bit better now the, uh, compared to universities, which tells you something too. Um, but I don't think universities in this case are always sort of doing it for nefarious reasons. I think a lot of it, we from our research, we found is, is in part due to... Um, to not prioritizing it and feeling that they don't have the research or so somebody specifically dedicated to plugging in the numbers uh, publicly on clinicaltrials.gov because it does take time, but, but you know, they get millions of dollars of research. You know, our argument is always, well, I'm sure you could find uh, some money to, to, to pay someone to do this. Uh, and that's what we've seen shift. So the overall, I will say what's been encouraging as a result of a couple of years of advocacy uh, from UAM and, and our allies is we have seen a, a generally a, a more positive shift, I'm happy to report, of universities increasing their reporting rates. But I will say what is extraordinary, in 2017, there was this final rule act um, that came out of the FDA and sounds, sounds a little terrifying, uh, but it gave universities a year to say that they were going to um, Report, register report their, their trials and missing trials. Um, and they could be fined $10,000 per day per trial for not reporting. And if you go to the FDA uh, trials tracker, which isn't actually, it pulls from the FDA, it's from, um, from clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, it's not, we had to, an allied organization had to create it because it didn't exist you can see the amount of funds uh, that the FDA could have fined universities. And it's wow. in the billions and billions. And when you compare that to the amount of money that we've just spent on COVID research, you think, well, my goodness, uh, that could have funded all of the vaccine uh, single-handedly had the FDA um, basically started to find these universities. But I will say, again, as... Um, we're, we're also proud to, to mention that uh, with some of our work in the last year, we've been able to get some responses from NIH and FDA about why they haven't been doing this and the fact that they've sent their first letter now to some of these universities to uh, warn them that they're gonna find them. So this is um, important ultimately because it does impact uh, healthcare spending and it, which means ultimately what we care about is uh, saving people's lives um, and making sure that we're holding these public institutions accountable, not just because they're receiving public money, but because they are investing in areas that we care about uh, from a public health perspective. Well, you guys are doing great work in that area, and I, I very much appreciate and admire it. So again, Marath Basie is Executive Director for North America of Universities Allied for Essential Medicines. And uh, where can people go to find out more about the work you, you folks do, Marath? Uh, UAEM.org. Um, the reports we mentioned already, uh, publicmedsforcovid.org, uh, globalhealthgrades.org, um, and uh, altreroute.org, all different tools. But you can find them all on UAM uh, and the website there. Um, and UAEM, mm -hmm. right. Your, your acronym is 75% bottles i just yeah. Yeah. Um, um, you can't blame me for that but uh, uh okay <laughs> um so again marath basie thank you for your great work and thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for for having me and uh we'll talk to you soon i look forward to it and we'll be right back after this i am richard rj escal and this is 
the zero hour.